then I'll okay. admit um, people. Sounds good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you again, Jean. No problem. Okay. Um, all right. Great. Well, um, thank you all so much for coming. I'm so excited to introduce Shannon. Um, I, yeah, I'm just so grateful that you've taken time to, to come and she even made us a PowerPoint. I'm just yeah, so excited. So um, while we do this, if you guys don't mind um, just um, taking yourself off um, by muting and, um, you know, if video, if you're comfortable is fine to leave on as long as it's not distracting, but usually I just tell everybody to take their video off as well. Um, and then um, I have some questions that came in originally from everybody. Um, and so we'll ask those first. And then if you guys want to um, chat, put um, questions directly to me in the chat box, that's great. But if we can wait until the end so that it's not popping up over and over and over all throughout the presentation, I'd really appreciate that. So um, but I don't wanna take away from, um, from Shannon's present or Dr. Bennett's presentation. So I'm going to let her talk and um, just very excited to have so many people showing up. I think you'll really appreciate um, all her wisdom. So I will let you take it away. Uh, yeah, can I play back in a little bit? <laughs> okay. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Great. Okay, so I am, uh, I, I do have a short presentation. It's about uh, just under 20 slides. And uh, it's meant to give an overview of the coronavirus. And my approach was to address what it is, where it came from. And I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I'm fascinated in my work by zoonotic infectious diseases. So I actually study uh, viruses that jump from natural systems into humans. I have worked on hantaviruses as well as many mosquito-borne viruses like dengue and Zika. I've never worked on a coronavirus system before, but many of those uh, viruses have ancestral forms in bats, as does this one, so it's very fascinating for me. So my head has been full. My husband says, quit acting so enthusiastic, and I'm trying <laughs> not to, <laughs> but the science in me, the scientist in me is is enjoying the uh, opportunity to really dive into the science behind coronavirus. So, um, I, so I'm going to talk about what it is, where it came from, and try to use some of the data we have today to understand where it's going. So I've sort of sec separated the talk into those three main sections, and um, hopefully we'll have lots of time for discussion at the end. All right, so I'm going to get started. And um, I have my screen up. Can everybody hear my? Uh, yeah, see my screen. So it should be pretty obvious. Yes, I think I. Yeah, we can all see it. Anybody's okay. not on mute. Can you please go on mute? Okay. So. Um, I'm at the California Academy of Sciences, Shannon Bennett. I only actually make my mother call me doctor because she always feels so proud of getting a doctor in philosophy that she always calls me doctor. But no, seriously, you can please call me Shannon. Um, and I'm the curator of microbiology at the California Academy of Sciences. So microbes mean like anything microscopic beyond visible light and viruses are the most microscopic of microbes because they're not only smaller than we can see with a light microscope, you have to use a scanning electron or transmission electron microscope to even see them. So a lot of what we know about viruses comes from seeing the host, the symptoms uh, that underlie a, underlie a virus infection or by looking at the genetic material that helps identify where, uh, where and what a virus is, what a virus is and where it came from. So that's what basically happened was that there was this novel uh, virus that occurred, whoops, sorry, this uh, novel virus that hit our radar. And um, when you visualize it, it actually looks like a crown and that's what, uh, where its name came from. So coronavirus is the group, the family of viruses that this virus belongs to. And it's 
getting that name from the halo that kind of surrounds it, that kind of looks like a crown, that's being driven by these little proteins the, and shown in red on the diagram. They're called spike proteins. They're the main protein that binds to the host cell receptor. So all viruses have to live inside a host cell to um, make their way in the world to replicate their genome. And this virus is no exception, and it uses these spike proteins to get into its host target cells. And uh, they kind of stick up quite a bit off the surface of the virus. Uh, they're embedded on one end into the envelope um, membrane of the virus, and um, the sticky outy part is what binds to the host cell. And we know the host cell receptor is ACE2 is one of the names. So uh, crown-like spike proteins, it's in the same group of viruses, the same family as other viruses that we know about. One is SARS, another one is MERS, and, and then a whole bunch of human coronaviruses. So we know that these viruses actually infect a wide range of mammals. Uh, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, um, infects, comes from bats, but it also infects palm civets. Um, MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, uh, was first observed in camels and it spilled over into humans, but ultimately it came from bats. And then it turns out that there's a whole bunch of seasonal uh, viruses that, that cause common cold-like symptoms that are also coronaviruses in humans that uh, circulate in humans and jumped into humans from bats maybe over the last couple of hundred years. So there's definitely, sorry, about a hundred years. And there's at least four main strains of human coronaviruses that circulate in And they account for something like 10 to 30% of all common cold cases. So when this virus was first uh, uh, identified and described, the naming of it is as follows. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus and the disease is COVID-19. And COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. And SARS-CoV-2 for the virus is so named because it is quite closely related to SARS-1, the first SARS, and um, so it's the second one. So it's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. So it's a little bit like the way we name HIV for the virus and AIDS for the disease. So, so it was first discovered in China in uh, around a case cluster associated with a Hunan seafood market. And this diagram shows you Wuhan on the left from a satellite image. And then you can zoom in and these little blue um, uh, structures are basically di different uh, tents and different carts and stalls in the market. And the first case cluster, and I'm, I'm moving my uh, arrow, um, the, the case cluster really started around the end of January, mid to end January, when it first hit the radar of medical personnel in Wuhan. And uh, contact tracing, which is basically asking, interviewing people and trying to understand where they were and who they might have been in touch with, linked many, many, many of those cases back to the seafood market. And all of those cases linked back to the seafood market are shown in red. So you can see that many of the cases in uh, this period of December were all linked to the market all the way back to December 10th. There is one other case that was not obviously linked to the market that was found as early as December 1st. So that was the first indication that there was uh, activity linked to the market. And actually that almost uh, served as a bit of a red herring because at the time officials assumed that there was not efficient human to human transmission, that it was animal to human transmission linked through the market and the repeated animal to human transmission events. So what they now know is that actually it was only a single uh, transmission event into humans from animals and then very efficient human to human transmission. So um, this is one snapshot of the number of cases now circulating in the world. So as we all know, we watched in horror as the number of cases in China grew. China is shown now in this yellow line. 
So the cases uh, grew a lot, so much so that uh, the early cases in December don't even rate on, on this map. They're too tiny, but they're there. And then, well, they're prior to this timeline. And then they grow, and then they basically hit a plateau. And this curve, this uh, case accumulation curve, is basically fairly standard for an epidemic in which cases grow very rapidly and then they level off and the cumulative uh, number of cases stays constant through time once the epidemic wave has passed. In contrast, these are all the cases in the world. It used to be that China dominated the world um, ticker counter of how many cases there were. Now that's not true. Of course, we know that other countries like Italy, the United States, Germany, Iran, not shown here, all uh, became um, very, um, to have lots of cases circulating. Italy surpassed China, and now the United States has surpassed both. So in all cases, uh, in overall in the world, we're still growing in the exponential phase of the outbreak. We have not turned the corner and started to level off. And that's certainly true in the United States. Uh, and uh, we are starting to see a hint that Italy is starting to level off. So this is basically another way of expressing that kind of data. A lot of this data is open access, and so we're able to download the data and sort of look at the patterns to try to understand where we are in the epidemic wave. So on the top panel are uh, different uh, countries' case accumulation, cumulative cases, uh, and here's China on the far left, and you can see the red trace is going up, like I showed you on the previous graph, and then leveling off, and it's now constant. Other countries like South Korea have a similar pattern. Pattern: They were off to a jump, a rough start, and then quickly grew exponentially and then leveled off. So this is a what we think of as kind of an S-shaped curve with early exponential growth rate, and then you have a flip or an inversion in or an inflection point in the S and then leveling off. Iran has started to level off. Japan kind of had a constant growth rate. So what that looks like um, down on the bottom panel in terms of daily new confirmed is really what I'm talking about when I talk about an epidemic wave. So in China, in terms of the number of daily new cases, there's a rapid increase in cases. It starts to become constant in terms of the number of new daily cases and then starts to level off and then finally drop. So there are still, even through March, daily new cases, but there are fewer and fewer daily new cases. And that translates into this flat part of the curve. So what we really want to do is understand where the US is in terms of the epidemic wave. So that's the wave, basically, an increase to a peak or crest of the wave, and then a decrease. Um, here is another panel showing Italy against Spain, France, Germany, and the U.S. And you can see that all, almost all these countries are still in, um, uh, certainly uh, France, Germany, and the U.S. are still uh, growing exponentially with many daily new cases a day. Italy and Spain starting to show a little bit of a bend where the jump in new cases per day isn't quite as big as prior days. So they're maybe getting to the crest of their epidemic wave. And then I wanted to look at the different individual states. Obviously, we know that New York is experiencing a lot of cases. At the time, um, Washington was second, but now uh, it's that's not the case. Actually, I think New Jersey is second and then California is third. In any case, all of the states in the US are still seeing exponential growth rates. So we're still in the exponential part of the curve um, in New York, in California, um, and in most other cases, most other states. So this is a graph that, I, uh, that our local um, newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, puts out, and it digs into the activities in different counties. And um, it's very uh, helpful for her individuals at my place of work at the California Academy of Sciences to sort of be able to think about where uh, cases are distributed in our county. Uh, a couple of days ago, unfortunately, San Francisco experienced its first um, 
death, but um, the number of deaths is still fairly low. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the biology of this virus and why its unique biology kind of contributes to the way this epidemic has played out. So this graphic shows the course of infection. Uh, somebody starts out infected, and then in the normal course, you would eventually have an incubation period prior to developing symptoms. And once you've developed symptoms, they can progress to uh, various levels of severity, and then finally the case is resolved, hopefully by the recovery of the host. What's unusual about this virus is that sometime in between when they're infected, but prior to when a host is symptomatic, they can transmit. So it's very rare for viruses to be efficiently transmitted at um, notable levels during the incubation period. So this period between infected and before symptoms develop. The problem with this is that before somebody develops symptoms, they're basically going about their business, mixing in the community, going to work, taking care of loved ones, teaching at school, going to school, uh, basically out there in the community and potentially transmitting. And we don't know exactly when somebody could begin transmitting, uh, but the range has been anywhere from two to 14 days when you can transmit before you're symptomatic. In addition, the symptoms can start out very mild. So they can be very kind of general, general symptoms and they can develop quite rapidly to hospital admission. In the US, uh, prior to very recently, we were only able to test people that were admitted to the hospital or the ER room. So it actually was very difficult to even assess the number of people that were symptomatic uh, mildly symptomatic and their contribution to transmitting the virus in the population. Uh, down here at the bottom, I've included the most dominant symptoms. So far, this came out of the, uh, uh, the Chinese study. It was published in uh, late February as a joint publication by the Chinese CDC and the World Health Organization. And it talks about 88% um, of all uh, cases that develop symptoms develop a fever. This is the people that develop symptoms. So there, there's also a large percentage of people that never develop symptoms. And that's coming in at around 80%. 68% uh, have dry cough, 38% fatigue, um, sputum production. So you can see that this is very, very similar to uh, traditional flu-like symptoms and further confounds the early detection of this virus, especially when it's transmitting during flu season when people might also have flu. So all of these, basically these unknowns, the fact that we don't know how many people are symptomatic, uh, will become symptomatic, and even while they're symptomatic, they tr could transmit, means that this virus has a, a great uh, ability to transmit in the community before cases are identified. So the modes of transmission for this virus, there's been a lot of publications about uh, whether it's airborne or aerosolized. And so I thought I'd just lay it out what we know is that it's mostly transmitted through large respiratory droplets that are produced by a cough or a sneeze. And this figure on the right shows a person coughing and you can, it's a time lapse, and you can see in the cloud of droplets that's produced, there's a large number of droplet sizes, a large range of droplet sizes. And um, this paper actually talks about the droplet sizes ranging from 0.1 microns to much larger. But the smallest one of 0.1 or 0.01 microns even, uh, th these are viruses that are only nanometers in diameter. So even tiny droplets can hold a lot of virus. Um, these large droplets basically start to fall to the floor. They're large and heavy, and they won't float in the air. Uh, some of them, the very tiny ones that might stay in the air, it turns out that this virus is fairly delicate. And so it doesn't survive in the air very long because it dries out. 
So the people that are at risk, most risk for airborne transmission are basically people that are working in a healthcare setting, working with uh, patients, particularly if uh, that patient needs to undergo intubation it becomes extremely dangerous because the process basically can nebulize or aerosolize um, very tiny droplets, as well as taking care of somebody who's producing very tiny droplets as well as large droplets. Most of us, if we're not around sick people, most of us as individuals are at most risk for picking up the virus through contact uh, with virus contaminated surfaces. And we call those fomites. Or sometimes I like to think of my phone, which I carry around and I put down and pick up and put down and pick up as a phonite. So I think uh, any surface that's a high touch surface, like a doorknob, an elevator button, uh, a keyboard uh, can, or a telephone can all be um, sources of surface contamination. Uh, clearly, you can also share it through sharing a drink or kissing through direct contact with mucus. And then what's really unusual is that this virus has been uh, shown to be fecally orally transmitted, so it's being shed in feces, so that's unusual. <clears throat> so take into account the various ways that this virus can transmit, as well as the fact that it can transmit before people are symptomatic. Uh, that rolls into a, an estimate of the ability of a given infected individual to infect the, num the other infected individuals ranging from two to four. So this is what we call the reproductive number or reproductive ratio of the virus. And it reflects the number of people an, a given infected individual can, trans can infect. So that means uh, with a range of two to four and say a median of 2.5, a single infected individual can infect two and a half people. MERS in contrast has a much lower reproductive number uh, of 0.7 and SARS has a reproductive number of about four as well. But with SARS, it would only transmit to people after you were symptomatic, so it was a much easier virus to get a handle on. This is uh, SARS-CoV-2 in a table um, with a note about its transmission mode in a table with other viruses that show in comparison how what their reproductive numbers look like. And I'll just pull out some highlights. Measles, for example, is highly transmissible and a given infected individual can infect up to 18 other people. Um, in contrast, uh, influenza, seasonal flu or Spanish flu, our uh, seasonal flu is much lower and Spanish flu is uh, right around two to three, so kind of on the same order of magnitude. So um, the other parameter that we care a lot about is the case fatality rate. So this graphic sums up uh, the data I mentioned about the reproductive number, and that's shown on the horizontal or x-axis. And it also compares these viruses on uh, a y-axis scale for case fatality rate. So this is basically the number of cases that are identified, what percentage of them uh, resolve in death rather than recovery. And this new coronavirus, hello, I heard someone say something. Sorry, somebody just entered, I muted them. Okay, no worries. Um, so you can see this sort of pink box here represents the uncertainty that we have around this new coronavirus. It's basically showing you the, the uh, range of estimates around the reproductive number going horizontally from two to four, as well as the fatality rate, which is very uh, also very broad with a median of up to or about three. So comparing that to say Spanish flu, which uh, is, a, is about the highest estimate that we're getting for the coronavirus, um, it, you also can see SARS, which was much worse. It killed uh, one in 10. Um, MERS was up to 35% case fatality rate, but much less transmissible. Um, so, uh, and then here we have measles way over here on the, on the far side, highly transmissible. 
with a lower mortality rate, case fatality rate. And then there's seasonal flu. And then here's the swine flu epidemic, uh, the H1N1 2009 swine flu, which was uh, not very deadly at all um, and not particularly transmissible. So that was the last pandemic as a society that we really had to deal with besides SARS in recent years. So one of the things I love to do is, um, as a scientist, is and I'm in, I'm really enjoying the crowdsourcing nature of this epidemic. So many many people are posting the data in public forums where everybody can access it. You can download it. You can analyze it and explore it. So I'm just going to pull some examples up. So this is out of date, obviously, because uh, this was done on um, a screenshot made on Wednesday. So I'm just going to pull uh, some of my favorites. We can, um, John Hopkins is really cool, but all the data is in red. Uh, and it kind of makes me a little, I have this sort of <laughs> emotional response to red. So I'm going to go to Worldometer. Um, I'm going to make this, this slide deck uh, available to everybody. But this is the Worldometer. Uh, link and it shows you that we're almost at 800,000 cases worldwide. It gives you a daily report on both the number of deaths and the recovered. Um, it, I mentioned those graphs and asking where are we in the epidemic curve. You can see that we are still in the exponential phase of the growth. We haven't bend, uh, seen the bend or the inflection point in the cumulative number of cases. Um, it also gives you a list of each country and how they're doing. So you can go to the US and you can see uh, that we are now um, obviously well surpassed the cumulative cases in China, 163,000. Uh, you can see that New York and New Jersey are in the lead. It reports the total new cases, uh, sorry, the total cumulative cases as well as the total new cases for that day, the total deaths and the new deaths for that day. And these data, remember I mentioned to you that we are on an ec epidemic wave and when the growth rate in the number of new cases starts to level off and eventually decline per day, we will have surfed uh, that epidemic wave and we'll be coming down the other side. So uh, one thing that I like to do is look at what that looks like. So if you scroll down on Worldometer, you can see the number of uh, the cumulative cases going up and up and up and up exponentially. And the daily new cases, and this is at a country level, so not a state level, and you can see them growing. And then the question I like to ask is, oh, are we starting to level off? my optimistic side says, oh, maybe we're going to start to level off soon, especially as we are all adhering to the guidelines of uh, social distancing. Uh, the other uh, um, crowdsource data I really like to explore is, um, oops, sorry, oops, is nextstrain.org. So nextstrain is the, um, a repository of, a, of genetic information. It's actually from this website, GISAID, but it pulls together all of the genetic information that we have and um, organizes it in a family tree, which we call a scientist a phylogeny. So this phylogeny is color coded by country, and every spot or circle represents a virus from a different country. And you can see there's over 2,241 genomes posted here. But let's just say here is um, a virus in red uh, that's from the US, from Wisconsin. And the date that this was collected was March 23rd. And the genome was sequenced, it was put into an analysis and uh, related in a family tree to other viruses. It turns out that it's actually related to a lot of viruses that are mixing um, around the world, including from Iceland, I can see France in this mix, as well as USA. Most of the USA viruses are sitting in this red clade. Most of the Chinese viruses are in this purple group. And you can see that the Chinese has been seeing steady decline in cases. There was a news article that said, oh, they had a resurgence of cases, but 
many of those cases they claimed were imports. Well, it turns out that they were imports. Like here's a China case that came in um, March 21st, and it's clearly an imported virus. It's not descendant from all the other China viruses, but rather it's descendant from a lineage that's circulating around the US as well as in Iceland. So sometimes for uh, kicks, I like to play this little graph and it shows you how the virus started out in China. You can see it here in China and, and it's corresponding to the tree, the genetic diversity of the viruses in the tree. And it's spreading uh, to Europe. It's starting another group of viruses here in Europe. Uh, it spread the other way and popped up in the US. It started another group of viruses localized to the US. So what this basically is telling us is that is, a, is three main things. One is that it's uh, got a single origin from uh, into humans, because this is all about the relative amount of variation you would expect if it jumped over once. And remember, I told you that the, initially the Chinese thought that it had jumped over multiple times, but it's only jumped over once from animals. And that it's evolving at a rate that we would expect. It's not accelerated. It's about one to three mutations per month. And it's organized more in geographic groupings rather than any particular strain of virus that's becoming, say, adapted to humans. And the last takeaway, I think now I'm at four takeaways, is that the, the distribution of changes is shown down here, um, which parts of the genome of the virus are changing. And it's kind of distributed across the genome. This spike right here is actually corresponding to the spike protein, which um, you can see here. So there's the spike protein. There are lots of changes in the spike protein building up, but no more in the spike protein than in other areas of the genome, not all of which we know what they do. Okay, so I'm gonna take you back because I did dive into um, a little bit of the uh, epidemiology, but first, before we do that, I wanna talk about the evolution of this virus. So I mentioned that uh, this whole group of viruses uh, comes from bats. And this is a family tree zooming in on that. It's a, this is an RNA virus. It's a single-stranded positive sense virus. It's got a genome of about 30 base pairs, uh, 30 kilobases, 10 genes. And as I said, it changes about one to three times per month. This is the new virus here shown in red, SARS-CoV-2. And there were two whole genomes that were published early on from China, January 1st and December 31st. So the, this way of labeling tells you the geographic origin as well as the date and some other identifier information. The most closely related virus to this virus in red is a, a virus coded in yellow that came from a bat from a different province, Yunnan, and from 2013. So this was collected under the auspices of a totally different study. And just the genetic information was posted online in public repositories. And when the people that discovered SARS-CoV-2 went to put it in a family tree of what was known, this virus popped out of the public database. It's 90% related and it's a bat virus. And so that's how we know that this virus came from bats. There were a few other studies, again, completely independent studies that had been sequencing pangolins in Guangdong. And they posted, as well as Guanzi, Guanzi, sorry, and those were also in the public repository. And they came from 2019, 2017, from different studies, from different time periods of sampling. And these uh, samples also sit in a family tree, particularly these two pangolin sequences that show that they're related to these SARS viruses. And just for your reference, here's the SARS, the first uh, SARS that emerged in uh, 2002 and three, and that's sitting here um, at, it's 80% related. So it's quite a bit distant from all these other viruses. And then here's MERS, um, which emerged in 2012, and it's even more different. 
And then there's a whole bunch of seasonal coronaviruses shown in, in green, and they have jumped into humans over the last hundred years. And what you'll notice is that most of these have bat precursor viruses in the family tree, suggesting that bats for sure are the, um, at least for this whole lineage, um, are the origin of these viruses. So I just want to point out that when SARS-1 was discovered, uh, people took time to do contact tracing and actually traced SARS to the palm civet in a market setting uh, by finding uh, and co-locating in space and time that animal and those viruses. This is not this has not been done with this virus. The, everything we know about where this virus comes from just comes from doing this phylogenetic or family tree analysis from published data that's out there. That means no one tested or no one has reported testing uh, viruses from animals that were actually sampled in that market or that were in a chain of contact with the early case clusters in Wuhan. So that work has not been done. So a lot of the information that can be derived from the, these genomes um, can tell us maybe what's different about this virus. So one thing that's different is certainly shown um, there are differences in the spike protein. So this is a three-dimensional model of the spike protein in gray. And this is the host receptor, ACE2, the human receptor in, in turquoise. And this is how the spike protein in the human coronavirus um, SARS-CoV-2 compares to SARS, and the red shows the difference. Many, many differences. Remember, this virus is only 80% related to the SARS-2. But the bat precursor, uh, which is this virus here, RATG13, uh, is very similar. Not a lot of red. Remember, this is 96% related. Uh, the surface protein, the spike protein, is actually up to 98% related. And the differences shown in red are all clustering around the binding site. So that suggests that there were changes in the binding site that, under, that are underlying how this virus made a jump into humans. So that's one major hypothesis, is that it can bind more efficiently to humans. There was actually a paper published uh, very recently that showed that there's another protein uh, the furin cleavage site that is also super important and it determines after the virus gets in how efficiently it's processed in the host cell to bud off and make new viruses and that's also changed. So we think this virus is better at getting into human cells and it's also better at um, getting through the cells to produce progeny. So I showed you nextstrain.org. I'm just going to skip through that. Okay, so we're almost done, <laughs> and I'm um, sorry that I maybe, hopefully didn't get too detailed, but no, amazing. good. Um, so one of the things that we've heard a lot is about flattening the curve, and the flatten the curve concept is really uh, diagrammed in this graphic here on the right. It talks about um, taking the um, number of cases down to below the level that the healthcare system can handle it. And so basically, if we socially distance, um, it would be maybe shown in blue. The number of cases, the growth rate, which I mentioned, you know, growth, this is the epidemic wave. It grows exponentially and then it flattens and then we get to the other side of the wave and it goes back down again. So if you can dribble the number of cases in to the healthcare system, even if they're growing exponentially, the exponent, the power is smaller and spread out over time, then we can actually handle the uh, number of sick people that need care better, more appropriately for our system. And ultimately that will reduce the case fatality rate. So when we see elevated case fatality rates in places like Italy, it's basically because whatever protective measures uh, were implemented were not um, implemented quickly enough or strongly enough to, to bring the curve below that dotted line of their healthcare capacity. And so the exponential growth rate of the virus outstripped their capacity to care for people. And even though they're maybe starting to see the crest of that wave and come back down, 
uh, they're still they're seeing a lot higher rates of fatality case fatality rates are higher so we're we're confident that the case fatality rate of this virus can be strongly mitigated and um, reduced if we flatten the curve which is basically taking protective measures in our case social distancing um, here in California, as well as at the federal level, there are many, um, uh, many things going on to invest. Our, our state declared a state of emergency, um, as well as our city and county, and that helped to bring healthcare infrastructure into place. I was just browsing both the, the NIH and WHO um, lists of clinical trials that are going on right now. There are over 220 clinical trials in the US. Um, to look at COVID-19 and around the world, there's a, the WHO registers over almost 600 cases. Um, there are quarantines and health advisories in, in effect. Um, many of these clinical trials are working on antivirals, vaccine development, as well as getting a better handle on the epidemiology of the virus. Um, we went into uh, self-isolation and shelter in place on um, March uh, 19th officially, but we were doing um, staging in different um, responses prior to that, like reducing crowds. Uh, here at the Academy, we have a, a, an incident command team where we're working, we made, uh, led by our chief uh, operations officer and our legal people to basically pull the trigger and close the academy. So we closed the academy on March 12th. Um, and so personally, I always like to give people, um, empower people to do what they can do. And basically, as I mentioned with the transmission of this virus, it, it should really, the droplets do tend to drop off within six feet. So this graphic here shows how we think coronavirus behaves and compared to something like measles, which is a tough virus. So it can stay in those tiny airborne droplets and survive a drying process much better than the coronaviruses, which are enveloped viruses in a, in a lipid bilayer membrane makes them very delicate. So we know that this virus probably can't survive very long in, in the air in an airborne state. So that means that we can really protect ourselves a lot if we don't get um, in contact with the viruses on contaminated surfaces. And what that means is that we need to wash our hands often and thoroughly um, with soap and water. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers is great. We need to try to avoid touching our face uh, with unwashed hands or the food that we eat with unwashed hands. And practicing social distancing is going to be very effective, especially if you're not in a forced to be in an enclosed room in a healthcare setting where you might be, um, even if you're six feet apart, you might be breathing, actively breathing the same air of someone that might be actively putting droplets into the air. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I will um, just, I'll start with the ones that came in um, with the applications. So um, other than pre, well, first of all, thank you. That was so informative and wonderful. <laughs> um, other than pre-existing conditions and advancing age, are there any other theories of why the virus is affecting people in such drastically different severities? For example, some have only mild symptoms while others are requiring ventilation. Right. Um, so this is not that unusual. A lot of viruses do this. Even influenza does this. Uh, Zika does this. Dengue does this. Um, probably unusually, um, viruses like SARS didn't do this as much, SARS-1. Um, for, uh, for different viruses, the the um, the bottom line is that it comes down to probably how we respond to the virus itself. So, you know, what makes you develop a fever is uh, your body's own immune response to the virus. And what's killing a lot of people is an, a, basically a dysregulation of that immune response. So the virus is infecting uh, cells in our lungs. 
and it's basically causing uh, an influx of cytokine communication. So many, so people have reported different cytokines and chemokines that shoot up, and um, that creates a cytokine storm and eventually organ failure. So that's what's really killing people that get into that very severe spectrum. But why do some people? Um, why are some people more likely to have a dysregulated immune response compared to others? And we don't really know, no one really knows. Um, there's some data that, that comes from flu, influenza data that shows that young people, a lot of young people just um, don't, uh, dis their immune system doesn't get so dysregulated compared to old people. Um, we don't know if that's because they're, generally naive so they don't kick into a more overreactive um, immune response or whether it's because they have prior exposure so they mitigate the infection earlier. So nobody really knows. And certainly with this virus, um, we haven't seen it before. So there shouldn't be any sort of prior immune effect. So lots more, uh, less known than is known. Okay. No, that's, that's fair. Um, and if people want to come on video, that's totally fine. Um, I just didn't want people to come off mute. But um, okay, so if someone got type A flu over the Christmas holiday, does that mean they're at higher or lower risk of COVID-19 or no impact at all? Um, I would say that if they recovered, they're fine. Okay. But I think with some people that get flu, they do um, have sort of lingering respiratory compromise. Maybe they're you know, um, they have some fatigue, lingering fatigue, or maybe reactive airway disease or something. So if you have any sort of lingering aspects of, of a prior infection, it can certainly compromise your ability to respond well to COVID-19. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we know about a half a dozen of individuals within our foundation that have had CF or have had COVID-19 and have had very mild symptoms um, and have, re sorry, am I, do I sound funny? Is anybody? You sounded fine. Okay. Then it's just on my yeah. end. Um, so that recovered more quickly than expected. Is it possible that the, um, the mucus in the CF lungs provide some level of protection by precluding the spike binding? or spike protein from binding to the AC or the ACE2 receptor. Sorry, I did a bad job reading that. No, that's, I mean, wow, that's kind of a cool observation. I don't know. Um, I, uh, I don't know how it, I mean, I think there could be so many potential mechanisms. I don't know whether the direct um, blocking of the binding site would be, um, the first mechanism I would look at, I would more look at how, um, how, what people's sort of immune status might be, their innate immune status, for example. Um, they might be just very um, generally well protected because they have a heightened innate immunity or, or something. But that's, those are, those, that's amazing. I don't, I've not seen anybody make those observations because most of the time, most of the data I've seen has been how comorbidities exacerbate people's response to COVID-19, um, not necessarily whether there are co you know, comorbidities that might actually help your response. Yeah. There's also an amazing number of um, potential um, treatments out there that people are trying that work against other uh, disease syndromes that uh, you know, work for different reasons or don't work for different reasons. So Interesting. I wonder if there are, might be certain medical or vitamin or pharmaceutical yeah. regimes that CF patients are on that might be an interesting clue. That is, yeah, well, you'll, you know, just let us know if you figure any of that out. <laughs> yeah, and I would, I, I would just add the caveat. Of course, I'm a I'm a the doctor, the kind of doctor that's a doctor of philosophy, not an MD, right. like a medical <laughs> doctor. So don't please if you if you have like lingering flu or anything, you go talk to your doctor. Right. <laughs> no, don't talk to me, your medical <laughs> care provider. That's fair. Um, so do you 
Um, can you test false negative or be out of incubation to test but have had COVID-19? Yes, you can test negative. And you can also, um, you can test negative when the virus is present and you can test negative because you cleared the virus okay. and you had it and you can test negative because you never had it. So those are the three <laughs> situations. Um, and that's because at least for now, the main test, the only test that's available on a wide scale is called a PCR test. Uh, and PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what it's doing is it's using primers, little short um, uh, molecules we call chains of nucleotides that are sequenced in a specific way to match to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in your system. And so if you have cleared the virus, it won't find a match. Once it matches, it will bind to it and then it'll start a process of copying the strand of the virus that it's bound to and then that copy number goes up and up and up and up and then we detect it in our system. So people can test negative if something in that copy process doesn't work also. So maybe the primer bound to the virus but the enzyme that we've put into the test doesn't work, doesn't kick off. And so it's super important to have a, a positive control in the test kit to, that, to show you that the, the um, enzymes are working. It's also very important to have a negative control to uh, um, prevent false positives from occurring. And um, that means that basically the virus, the primer might bind to something else that isn't the virus, or it could bind to the virus, but that virus was maybe a contaminant. Um, so the other things in the test kit are also uh, things that are related to SARS-CoV-2, but they're not an exact match, uh, so that we can make sure that it's not binding to, say, SARS-1, <laughs> which would be crazy. Right. Um, and so so the so the big picture question the big picture is that yes you can uh, test false negative when the virus is present if the test fails and the you know there has been some um, test problems and also you have to be able to execute it at a lab where they have the right machine and the right handling skills the sample itself has to be fresh and delivered timely so at one point there was a test uh, there was some challenges when they got the test kit right but they were having problems processing swabs and they weren't getting done timely so lots of reasons to test negative um, that where it's a false negative and then the other thing that's very limiting about this test is that it really can only detect active virus that's present and we know that the minute you start to recover the virus um, population in your blood plummets or in your system because it's not necessarily in the blood it's in sputum and mucus it plummets and so it's if once you've started to recover there's almost no point in testing because the virus is almost below detectable levels and very soon to be gone. Okay. So the ideal situation is a test that's not based on direct detection of the virus, but a test that's based on the antibodies that you develop to the virus. Okay. And those tests are, um, there's a, there's, uh, there was just a publication released on one antibody test that's going to be rolling out. It's been picked up by a manufacturer in this country. And then there are other tests going on in other countries. There's another, there's also a test um, for um, a, a rapid test, which is basically like your, your pregnancy test yeah. kit, which anybody could run. And it's based on the lingering proteins of the virus. So you can test the sequence of the virus, the proteins of the virus, the proteins of the human, the antibodies of the human. Okay. Wow, that's neat. So stay tuned. There will be better tests soon. I hope. Fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Well, then we'll keep keep our fingers crossed for that. Yeah. Um. All right. So we've seen reintroduction of society in Wunan as new infection and deaths are drastically lower. Does this population mainly consist of just healthy and past infected individuals? Um, do you know if high risk patients are still on self quarantine in Wunan? 
I, so I actually don't really know what's going on in China right now. <laughs> and they, they do, um, I, the, one of the reasons I mentioned that the Chinese CDC and the WHO produced a joint report is because there is a lot of questions from us, from the rest of the world, wondering how much of the data in China we can trust and whether uh, they're reporting uh, faithfully what's going on. And so uh, I think that joint report is good data, uh, but I don't, don't really know whether we're getting a good um, insight into what's going on. I do know that um, two weekends ago, they started opening up museums and we have colleagues in, uh, I have a colleague that works uh, about 400 kilometers outside of Wuhan and they were all going back to work um, and that was around March 10th. So people were starting to go back to work. So um, Mike and we also have a student at the academy that's based in China and they were going back to university. So they're letting people go back. There was that flare up around March 23rd or 21st that um, they the Chinese government claimed was imported cases. Um, so, but there's been another flare up. So, but if you look at the big picture of the epidemiologic wave, it's just a little bit, right? It's okay. just, um, it's still very small. I'm going to take us back to, can you guys see my screen? Did I stop sharing? Um, I think I stopped you sharing. Do you want me to reshare? Yeah, I'm gonna reshare. What, let's just go, um, we're going to go back to China. And, um, I am going to hold on. There we go. Okay. So, can you see that we're back to the worldometer? Yep. And everybody can see. Let's go to China and see what they're saying. So, here in China, the summary is that they had 31 new cases. And about two weeks ago, they actually had a couple days where they reported zero new cases. So first, first assumption, do we believe that they're <laughs> reporting all their data? That's okay. That's a bit of a question. But in the big picture, it, it looks like they're still fairly um, level. And in this big scale right here, you can see that it's it's barely hitting the radar. So in the big picture of things, they're still at the end trail end of the wave. So the question is really that we're all wondering is as they let people all go back, will this flare up and will they head into another peak? That's the big question. Yeah. Um, and the answer to that question really depends on a lot of data that we don't have any, nobody has, which is basically, when you're on the other side of an epidemic, you look back and you ask, um, you, you want to basically assess the population, test the population with these antibody tests I mentioned. And you want to do a, a swath of the population to try to understand the number of true infections out there, whether people have protective immunity to, uh, the, to the virus. So how many true infections there were relative to the number of known cases and how, um, how the immunity is existing in the population so that you can understand, um, you know, why did the epidemic wave dribble out? Did the virus run out of effective um, susceptible people in the population? Did herd immunity build up or was it just this, you know, a lot of social distancing reduced the number of susceptibles and could it flare up again really fast? Um, and we just don't know. We don't know. That's the problem. But I mean, one thing we do know is for sure, um, 81,000 cases is just a very tiny fraction of the population in China. And so as a country, the virus certainly shouldn't have run out of susceptibles, but effectively in terms of the number of people exposed to an infected individual, this must be very limited through social distancing and other things. So I guess the end point is we don't know if the virus has run out of running room or whether it will flare up again. 
and we don't know how those susceptibles are distributed in the population. Okay, okay, no, that's perfect. Um, okay, so um, even with proper PPE and proper hand washing, can COVID-19 be contracted? Um, so if you recall those, those modes of transmission, since I'm still sharing, yeah. I can like yeah. go back. Um, so I think um, the, the, so there are some really unusual routes like the fecal or oral, but let's skip that for now. Um, so I think the problem is that we don't, that these are all possible routes and which, which of these routes becomes the main route really probably varies depending on the situation. So for me, like for you or me, that's not working in a medical setting. Um, most of the time, if we wash our hands, the, the washing hands is gonna protect us from this fomite situation. Now, occasionally I forget to wash my hand and I might touch my eye. And it turns out that humans touch their face up to 90 times or more a day. We just can't help it. Points. Like, yeah, it's crazy, right? So you can imagine that that I would like forget, or any one of us might forget. If now now that we're home, the likelihood of me running into a surface that's cross contaminated is very low. Um, but um, when we were out and about, or if I go to the grocery store, for example, and I pick up a product off the shelf and I put it in my basket, and I'm treating my hands as hot. Um, but I might accidentally touch my face before I have a chance to wash my hands because it's inherent and instinctive. Okay. Um, I might, um, the, one of the reasons, I don't know if folks are going to the grocery store, I've been going to the grocery store and if I see somebody down an aisle, I won't go down that aisle. And so that's basically because, you know, let's say they're asymptomatic, but they have it and they accidentally get a tickle in their nose and sneeze, then there could be droplets in the air. And so six feet is a good, um, is a good thing to try to do, but you know, there's always risk of potentially picking it up. But if you lived in a bubble and you uh, washed your hands constantly, then that's pretty much a guarantee and that's basically what we're trying to do with social isolation is that we're trying to just be socializing within a family unit and basically reducing the chances of us picking up virus off a contaminated surface or running into airspace where someone has coughed or sneezed that we don't live with that might deposit virus into the air we breathe absolutely so um on that note like thinking of grocery stores and um, such, since it's impossible for any of us to really <laughs> stockpile yeah. for the whole course of this. Um, of course. <laughs> what do you recommend, like when people come home and they've got all their groceries, like right. do you wash things? Do you, like what is kind of your protocol and what, what works and what doesn't work? I mean, we have people that are washing their mail. We have people that yeah. are putting <laughs> boxes in the sun. Like what, what, yeah. what is your take on all of that. Yeah. So, so I'll tell you one of the challenges is that there's so much information out there that has not been peer reviewed. So um, people might um, say it once, post it on Twitter, but to really know for sure, uh, you, you have to do a proper controlled study. So there was, there's, there was just a paper published, a peer reviewed paper published that said that, um, the virus, they, they recovered living virus off of droplets that were deposited on surfaces up to 72 hours. Okay. So, so this is much better than the original guesswork that was going on around, out there was anywhere from up to 20 hours to up to nine days. So at least now we have an idea. Mm -hmm. And it lasted the longest, the, the 72 hours was the longest on plastic interesting and it didn't last as long on so copper was the shortest they did copper cardboard stainless steel and plastic and 
copper it died the fastest and plastic it lasted the longest up to 72 hours and i can't remember the order of stainless and cardboard and um and and the other rumor the other infodemic information out there is that it can live on clothing like if you cough into your sleeve and that it can live on uh, handkerchiefs and there's been no peer-reviewed data to ask that question how long might it live on cloth um so basically what i do personally and like no one's done the study is that if i come back from the grocery store i'll put my items out on the picnic table i will put my bags my grocery bags aside just weighted down by a rock outside and i'll just leave them for three days i'm not going to use them okay um and what's you know what's killing the virus is mostly it's drying out it's a delicate virus um, and UV radiation is great, but even if it was like on the underside of the bag, it's going to dry out and die. Okay. Um, in theory, right. <laughs> they didn't, like I said, they didn't test cloth, but certainly um, on a plastic surface, 72 hours seems to be its limit. Okay. Um, and then I do wipe down uh, anything that I can wipe down before I put it in the fridge, or I might, like, if I bought, buy a, a box of tea. I might just open the package, dump the bags out onto the kitchen table without touching anything, and then recycle the tea box okay. without touching it. And then I basically treat my hands as hot. Okay. And then I go inside the house. I make my daughter, my 14-year-old daughter, take the clean groceries into the house, and then I'll wash my hands. Okay. Okay. No, that's and I'll, cool. And I'll wipe down my mail with a, with a wipe. Okay. And so um, bleach works and alcohol works and all of kind of standard yeah. okay yeah so standard wise this this virus is not um a particularly tough virus which means the standard protocols so no one's done it um no one's done for some cleaning products and chemicals it's been tested but for others the epa just published a list of chemicals you could use and some of them are um are uh um being you know they work on similar viruses so they're assuming that they work on these viruses okay. so i'm happy to send you the link yeah, that would be to great. the the household sort of chemicals and cleaning methods um and you can share that out and that would be great. it's basically you know 60 to 90 percent alcohol okay either either isopropyl isopropyl or ethyl okay and then my 10% bleach to be safe, although I saw somewhere that somebody said 3% bleach. So I, my, Wasted. my husband, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think err on the side, but I will send you the link and it gives you okay. every product out there and whether it's effective. Perfect. That sounds great. That would be wonderful. And then I'll send it out to everybody. Yeah. Um, okay. So my husband must work in the field as an employee of our local department of water and power. I'm thinking about viral transmission. Am I thinking about viral transmission correctly by thinking that although I'm in isolation because my husband is going out into the field, I'm essentially being exposed to everything he is coming across. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a good, um, a, a safe practice to assume that everybody in your family is going to be sharing virus with you if they have it. So, so we basically have to think of ourselves as living in some kind of a unit with somebody else. And then it really becomes a matter of um, those other people in your family. You need to make sure that they assess their and mitigate their risk in a way that you know about and can trust. Okay. So, okay. Um, so I'll give you an yeah, oh, go sorry. ahead. No, you go. <laughs> so one example might be like my neighbor said, my my um my college age daughter wants to keep babysitting. And so you can imagine that that the minute that that, that person babysits a child, then those people become part of your family unit, your transmissing unit. Okay. And and if you don't know them very well and you don't know how they mitigate their own risk then you you basically can't m mitigate your risk because you don't you don't know what they're doing. So whereas if someone's in your family unit, 
you can say, hey, 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 go wash your hands. <laughs> or or hey, you just, let's go to the grocery store. Okay, let's wash our hands. Like, you know how people are mitigating their risk. So I would assume that she, you know, has a conversation with her husband and says, okay, how are you mitigating your risk? Okay, are you wearing gloves when you touch this? And are you washing your hands when you touch that? Things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if someone has already had COVID-19 and recovered, we know the likelihood is that they may have potentially some immunity against becoming sick again. Um, is it possible though for them to carry and transmit the virus if they're re-exposed? Um, so, so we know that when they recover, uh, they recover. So that, that it's not going to be like some forms of malaria, which can okay. uh, set up um, a latent state and then resurge. Okay. But what we don't know is whether that person can be reinfected anew. And then if they are reinfected anew, we presume they can transmit again, just like before. Okay. But um, so what we don't know is that we know that there is immunity to this virus that develops and that there is um, both antibody, B cell based and T cell based immunity. What we don't know is um, how how neutralizing it is, like how protective it is, okay, and how long that lasts. Okay, okay. No, that makes so you know it could be like a, you know a, if like the other human coronaviruses lead to short-term immunity and you're basically able to become reinfected okay. within a year. Okay. That's helpful. Um, okay. Just now I'm onto the chat one. So there are just a couple here. So um, is there a temperature in which the virus can be killed or is it not sensitive to temperature? Um, so there was a non-peer-reviewed uh, mention that the virus is uh, not good at heat at a heat in in the ambient world of about 26 or 27 degrees celsius okay but um that was not peer-reviewed data and what i'm thinking from everything i've read is that it's not so much temperature as humidity and so mm -hmm. it dries out okay so i don't know if like 26 or 27 is the magic number i think probably it just dries down too fast. I mean, it's doing fine in the human body, which is at 96, right. to, you know, it's 96 degrees. So it's doing just fine. So I, I have a funny feeling that it's not, especially when it's in a cell, it's not going to be temperature sensitive. So when it's out in the environment, it might be ten temperature sensitive, but I imagine it's mostly because of the humidity. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so once someone presents symptoms, how long can we assume they're contagious? And how long should a sick person self-isolate after presenting symptoms? So for those of us who have close family and friends who are not staying at home and going to work um, against local laws and, of course, ethics and morals, um, yeah. I like that, Amy, that's awesome. What is the best way to convince them to stay at home to protect the most vulnerable? Sorry, that yeah. was a good point. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, for sure, if you're – so I showed that um, – this graphic here that talks yeah. about the app that this is all average number of days. So there's a huge okay. variability in terms of how many days you might be um, symptomatic. And basically as far as we know, um, you know, it's, it, it, you are, you are basically capable of infecting other people the whole time. Okay. Except that it does, it definitely goes down very quickly once the symptoms abate. So at the point where the symptoms okay. resolve, they, the, the virus basically gets cleared really quickly and you can't transmit anymore. Okay. So um, I've, I've even heard, you know, it's just like when you're allowed to send your kid back to school after 24 hours of fever free without medicine, um, without fever reducers. Right. It, I've even heard people say you can go back as soon as all that. But I personally, I think I saw another paper that said, you know, wait 48 hours. Okay. Um, this is something where I would definitely consult with your medical care provider to uh, check when you should circulate back into the system. But it does drop off pretty fast after symptoms abate. 
okay. if you've been symptomatic. Right. If you never develop symptoms, um, then it's extremely hard to know when you've started to clear the virus or if you're just hosting it. And people have been have taken um, some something crazy like 21 or more days to resolve the case. Wow. So if you don't have the marker of symptoms and you're just right. presumed positive because a family member was positive, you definitely have to err on the side of safety and self-isolate. Okay. okay. Perfect. So um, this one is, I'm curious if it stays in the lungs. If it stays in their lungs, maybe hitting them later and post-transplant, but no pre-transplant things would stick in my lungs. Are there people, and also are there people who would be immune to this? I think you answered that. Already. Yeah. Well, it, it, is, it, it is worth pointing out that this is not at all like um, tuberculosis, for example, okay. where you can host a latent infection with very kind of obscure, generic, mild symptoms in some cases, or even be a super spreader and asymptomatic. Um, I mean, in these cases, you can be um, a super spreader and be asymptomatic, but it's not going to linger for months. It's, okay. it's probably uh, most viral infections, except for hepatitis C and HIV and Human papillomavirus. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but yeah. in this case, it, in this case, it's definitely an a, acute infection that will okay. come in, um, may or may not hit hard, and then you clear it. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah. Um, somebody's asking if if gloves are necessary, like, is that overkill to like be wearing gloves when you're out and about, or is that helpful? I mean, so with gloves, I, I wear gloves in the lab when I work on viruses. Um, I, I do that to, um, you know, protect, you know, there are some viruses, for example, you know, dengue can actually, if, if you have a, a paper cut or, an exposed nail bed, you can, you know, could potentially get it through, through blood. So, so most of the, most of the time, um, at least, you know, for this virus, we don't think that it can, you know, get into your, in through your hands, through abrasion, through okay. an abrasion wound or something like that. Um, however, more the, <laughs> yeah, it's more, yeah. it's more like the, on the surface of your hands and then where you, what you do with those hands. So okay. for, for me, for me, gloves could be a great way to remember yes. that your hands are hot <laughs> right. and you should not touch anything with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, also my colleagues of many and myself too, our hands are starting to get really dry from all the washing. So. Right. Oh, think, absolutely. Yeah. So I think gloves are fine if you understand that it's the surface issue, not, it's not that they can get in through micro abrasions or anything. Okay. Okay. And then kind of on that same note, I feel like the media is given the acts against wearing masks in public, but obviously people with CF like are wearing masks in public very often. Um, yeah. And then there was the talk of wearing masks and potentially, you know, trapping the virus in the mask. Like, what's your perspective yeah. on the mask in public? Oh, and gosh, I know <laughs> uh, it's such. I mean, I've I, I there's been so much back and forth about it, and of course, a lot of um, many many things to consider um, as an individual and as a community. So, in terms of individuals, um, a mask. A, a cert, like a plain paper surgical mask or even a bandana or something, yeah. uh, certainly that will probably help trap droplets if you're an infected person. So preventing you from spreading outwards a droplet. But we don't really know what the effectiveness of those masks are for protecting you from getting infected. So... Okay. If you're trying to prov if you're trying to use a mask when you go out because you're sick, well, that's not a good idea anyway. Right. So it's really, I don't think using a mask uh, to give yourself permission to go out and about is is a good idea. But in terms of protecting you from getting virus, um, what you know what 
the, the only kinds of things that have really been well tested are N95s or N99s, which are these kinds of masks that have a built-in filter where most of the, the most of the masks plus the filter block 90 N95 means 95% of the particles are blocked okay. from getting in. Okay. So those are the kinds of masks that the, that the, as a society we're trying to reserve for healthcare workers. And, and, and that's because they are the ones that are most often in a room right. with a patient that's essentially kind of nebulizing virus right. droplets. And they're the ones that really need to avoid um, respirating those droplets. Okay. Um, for most of us, a mask, if, if we can keep the six foot distance, for most of us, that's, a mask is, no, is not, um, you know, is not as as necessary just because it's not going to be the most likely route okay. for the virus to get into our system. The most likely route, if we're healthy and we're around other quote unquote asymptomatic healthy people, is through the contaminated surface. Okay. In which case, the mask is not going to be the primary defense. Right. So, I, I mean, I don't think masks hurt. They they would only hurt if you use them as a permission to not right. wash your hands oh, right. <laughs> or as permission to go out when you're sick or if they resulted in a shortage of the people at Absolutely. most at risk but i so i don't think that they're they're bad except that my mom said i keep adjusting my mask and i say mom stop touching your face <laughs> yeah. if you use the if you wear the mask in a way that makes you touch your face more it's going to be right. worse <laughs> so not helping defeating yeah. the purpose um, yeah okay. so all of the dialogue out there about masks is really i think bottom line um trying to make sure people uh don't contribute to a shortage but also recognize right. that a mask shouldn't give you a false sense of okay. imperviousness. That makes sense. Okay. Unless you're a healthcare professional, and then it's certainly important. Right. Okay. So um, the whole takeout food. Ah, uh, what's yes. your what's your <laughs> on the delivery and the uh, pickup? Yeah. Plan? So I uh, I have been. Uh, let's see. The last time I got takeout was a couple days ago. Okay. Um, I am, I'm making two assumptions. One is that the basic food industry has levels of hygiene that are, that are good enough. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, patronize a place that didn't have right. good food hygiene uh, in terms of, you know, people wear hair nets and gloves when they prepare food, etc. And then I also have been asking my favorite restaurants what their employee sick leave policy is because i think that's the other thing is if they yeah. if they don't have a good sick leave policy and their employees are showing up sick exactly. then um then i think that would make me not want to uh, give my business to that place so i Absolutely. say i say reward places that have good sick leave policy, treat their workers well, have good levels of hygiene, and then I'm tipping at least 20% because I think I like these it. people <laughs> need every little help that they can get. And then I'm also throwing out, I mean, I'm just, I'm getting rid of the packaging before okay. I, I, I bef and then washing my hands and then okay. handling the food with washed hands. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Last question that I have is, um, I have duck masks given to me from my transplant team. Are those, are those ones okay? Um, because it has to go get labs drawn regularly and has to go into the hospital setting. Um, uh, so actually I don't know what a duck lab is, a uh, duck mask is, but, um, the, there is a there is a website. The CDC does have a website that goes through a full list of kinds of uh, masks and respirators, and if and they talk about the okay. basic surgical mask, which is just a physical blocker of okay. of big droplets. Okay. And then they talk about N95s and N99s, which actually do filter smaller particles up to a certain level of microns, and I don't remember what. Okay. And so it would be really good maybe if this person 
looked at the, at the manufacturer of their mask and looked against the CDC website on respirators. Okay. Okay. Great. We can, which I can send you to, I can okay. send you the CDC respirator site and um, the household cleaning site. Awesome. I will definitely um, check or send those on to people. Okay. So two last okay. ones came in and then I'm going to no let you problem. go. No um, problem. No problem. But um, a family member is essential in a cheese factory in Wisconsin, and they aren't allowed protection while on the floor. Is there anything that they can do at this point? Um, yeah, where to start with that? But yeah, I mean, we we have the same we have the same uh, issue a little bit but at the academy, which is a public facing. It's a natural history museum that has a public floor, and we struggled with this too. It, and that was, uh, and this was before we closed. And that the struggle was, oh, should should the should our pre people, our staff on the front line, um, be wearing uh, protective personal equipment? And what we decided to do was to have them wear gloves, but not masks. Okay. And the reason that that we did that was because. That all of them were able to keep six feet distant, uh, but they were uh, sometimes like passing a credit card back and forth. And okay. and we've now since you know well now we're closed. Right. But at one point you know we decided not to take any cash and we just okay. um, had people enter their put their credit card into a machine so there was no physical exchange. Um, so I would ask uh, I would wonder whether. Um, the protection, the kind of job that this person is doing, if it's if it's public facing, um, is there not some kind of protection that could be put in in place? Like uh, we, my my mom is in Canada, and and all the grocery stores have put up a little plexiglass shield so that they don't have to speak to the public. Yeah, That's amazing. So they can see people, but they don't have to like share the air as directly. Right. Um, and so I would, and then if this person is in, in the back of house uh, preparing the cheese, they should definitely be wearing right. gloves. I know, and that <laughs> sounds like they're 60 and a people on the lab coat. Floor. Yes. Okay. 60 people on the floor. They're not allowed to wear protective gear and definitely closer than six feet. Sounds like it just needs to close. <laughs> I think they should be closed or they should be allowed to wear. Um, personal protective equipment and that could be uh, you know gloves and a and right. a, a mask maybe yeah. yeah okay that would be so the, the, I think that would be better yes I know um and then let us know which um cheese that is no just kidding yeah um, right <laughs> <laughs> did um and someone just wanted to clarify did you say that 80 percent of COVID positive um patients aren't symptomatic that's so yes so so the number is very uh, blurry, and but that was one of the numbers I I did send say eighty percent, okay. and I've seen a, another estimate of like eighty five percent. But the problem is that um, pe the people there no, they're, it's confounded with people that are incubating but not yet yet symptomatic versus because that can be really long versus people that will never become symptomatic. Um, so there was a couple of studies um, done on families in China where they could, at least to the extent of the study, monitor whether that family member developed symptoms. Oh, okay. And so some of that data comes from that. But most of the population level studies, it's completely confounded. So we, it might be 80% asymptomatic, uh, but some of those may still develop symptoms once you wait long enough. Okay. So it's really hard when there's such a huge long incubation period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Shannon, thank you so much. This you're welcome. Valuable, really. Yes, you're so welcome. Uh, stay safe and healthy and yes, you too. try to try to I'm trying to take one day at a time and not yeah. think about exactly <laughs> the long term because um, yes. it's crazy. And I'll just make a personal observation that um, the other day I was out in my yard and a fox walked by at twilight and it turned and looked at me as though, and the expression on it face, its face was, is that a human? I haven't <laughs> seen one of those in ages. Yeah, right? and it, it was so... Long 
I feel like what the wildlife, and as I'm sitting here talking to you, there are two deer, and I'm not really that far outside of San Francisco, um, so but I feel like the wildlife Everything is kind of reclaiming. Yeah, right. they're like, okay, Aww. humans are all hunkered down. We're going to have yeah, a little right? fun. <laughs> I like that plan. So a little silver lining. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there are lots of thank yous are coming in and, and gratitude for your time and, and everything. Yes. You're welcome. And it's my pleasure. And um, I can only imagine how crazy this must be. Um, just trying for people to try to wade through all the information out there. It is daunting and it changes every day. So Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to help where I can. And I'll just give the caveat that we're still learning so much about this virus. So everything I told you could turn out to be wrong in, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> So, uh, sorry. <laughs> well, we, we do the best what we you can know right now. It's, yeah, it's very helpful for all of us. Yeah, so thank you. And I was very, very excited to look at all the clinical trials that are underway. Um, the whole world has gotten a run on this, uh, a, a head start on this virus, and there are many, many great, great ideas and therapeutics and tests and vaccine candidates so that is wonderful uh, to hear so it's it's nice to know that there's a light down there (laughs) yes yeah exactly wonderful thank you so much you're welcome take care everybody yes yes you too we've been doing the star trek live long and prosper (laughs) from a distance (laughs) that that makes total sense it's really i gotta practice that a little bit (laughs) it's hard you have to get your you have to massage your hand (laughs) get ready for it no, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I hope you have a wonderful night and thank you again. Thank you, Kat. You too. Absolutely. Take care. I'll send you the link as soon as it's done downloading. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yes. Bye. Bye.